<clears throat> the second lesson for this Sunday, which I think is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, is from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. That's one of his great letters. They're all great. Uh, but uh, Ephesians is, is a beautiful letter, and I'm going to read just a little portion of it from the fifth chapter. And this is what Paul wrote to the people there in Ephesus. He wrote, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord, with all your heart, always and for everything giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would impart your holy word through my words and the meditations of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> okay. <coughs> There's kind of three uh, parts to this, uh, this text that I just read that I want to have us focus on. And the first one is where Paul writes, be careful then how you walk. And uh, that's very, very important instruction. There was a guy back in Minnesota where I spent, uh, we spent all but three of 30 years, and this man was uh, a businessman, quite successful, and he was the head of a company that required him to do quite a bit of traveling. And so he decided, you know, what I should have is a, is a plane, not a jet, not one of these real expensive, but just a prop propeller plane so I could fly around uh, to these uh, towns instead of having to drive all the time because he'd have to drive over to North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin and down into Iowa. So he thought, I'm going to do it. So he took flying lessons, bought a plane, took flying lessons and uh, uh, so then he started flying when he had to go to the, here and there to different parts of the company that he was in charge of. He would fly. It saved a lot of time and he really enjoyed it. Well, uh, then uh, this, uh, he was, like I say, successful, and so they were able to have a cabin, a lake cabin. That's a big deal in Minnesota, right? Yeah. You can have a cottage up on the lake. It's great. They had one on Lake of the Woods. Yes, Lac du Bois, as they said. <laughs> See, that was settled by the French, Lac du Bois. So, they had a cabin up on the Lake of the Woods. <laughs> well, that's about three, a good 300 miles from the, from the cities. That's how we refer to the Minneapolis thing. You, the cities, that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, he said, well, I want to fly uh, on the weekend. When we go to the lake, I'm going to fly. I'm going to drive, you know, seven hours to get to the cabin. So, he bought a plane with pontoons. And uh, so that way, on the weekend, if they were going to go to the lake, it was good. he'd fly the lake, and, or the plane with the pontoons, right down on the lake to the woods. Mm -hmm. Over to their cab. What could be better? <laughs> well, one day, they were going to go up to the lake. And he wasn't paying much attention to what, and his wife wasn't paying much attention to what they were doing. They drove out to uh, this small airport where they had the hangars, you know, where he had his two planes parked. And he got into one of them, and off they went. 
and he was, you know, and, and uh, well, and they got they got into the to the pontoon one because they were going to the lake, but and so they were flying on, and they were he was thinking, he was always thinking about business or stuff, and so when he got up near Lake of the Woods. He started to go down. He started to go down at the little airport in Roseau. Anybody ever been to Roseau, Minnesota? <laughs> no? He should go there. <laughs> and he was going to land at Roseau. And he was going down. All of a sudden, his wife, she looked up from the book she was reading. She said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to land. She said, you can't land here. You could, this is the plane with pontoons. <laughs> this Whoa, oh, and so he went, phew. Oh, wow, he said, I don't know what I was thinking about. So he went over to Lake of the Woods, beautiful lake, still, and he set her down, phew, and stopped. And he said again to his wife, boy, I'm glad you caught me. That could, we could have been, that would have been awful. I said, I really don't know what I was thinking about. I guess I thought I was in the other plane. Oh, well, we're here safe and sound now. He opened the door and stepped out. <laughs> <laughs> and almost drowned. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> That's a little story, obviously, having to do with be careful how you walk, right? But... <laughs> The point is, what Paul is saying is really important, and of course he's not referring necessarily just to physical walking. Although, as we get older, we have to be a little more careful about how we walk, don't we? I mean, that's true too, you know, you're not quite as limber, but what he's talking about is be careful how you live your life. Be careful how you live from day to day. And then he says, uh, don't, be, don't be foolish about it. Don't be unwise. Be wise. And then he says, because we live in evil days. Kind of interesting, isn't it? And you see, the reality is that nothing's changed. Back in those days, those Christians who lived in Ephesus had to be careful. He's reminding them to be careful because they had to be. Because what they were about as followers of Jesus was absolutely illegal. Right? For the first, for the first 300 years of the existence of the church, it was illegal to be a Christian. And it was. And every once in a while, the Roman authorities would decide to do a little persecuting. Sometimes they'd do it almost for the fun of it. Sometimes they would do it to distract attention from other problems. See, they didn't really care. You could have your little foolish religion if you wanted it. But remember, you must always be ultimately subservient to Rome. The Caesar, Caesar Augustus. I mean, it was a tyranny like all other tyrannies. And so be careful how you live. Now, for us, we don't have to worry about that. When Paul talks about evil days, he was talking about a situation quite different from ours, right? Nobody's going to be arrested today for being here. The police aren't going to come busting in the door and arrest anybody or shoot anybody. We, you know, sometimes I think we forget how thankful we should be for the freedoms that we often take for granted. Do you know, I'll give you a little uh, history lesson. Do you know, you know that, the, that, that we live under the Constitution of the United States, which is seven articles. And, uh, and then there's the, the Bill of Rights, which were passed right along with the Constitution. The Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments. Because the founding, the people said, well, we want, you know, we don't, we don't want just a system of government, an executive branch, legislative, judiciary. That's what the seven articles are about. 
We want to make sure that it's right there in black and white that we have certain freedoms, certain rights. So they said, okay, we'll have a Bill of Rights. And the First Amendment to the Constitution guarantees five rights. You know what the first one is? Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. The Founding Fathers knew that that is the most important. Congress shall make, here it is, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then it goes into freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and freedom to redress of grievances. Those are the five. But the first is freedom of religion. For most of history, and even today, in most places in the world, people do not have what we have. Huh? So we should be thankful for the freedoms that we have. But that's not to say that the days are totally safe and sound. The days are evil. Be careful how you live. Let me give you kind of a mundane example, but I don't know. I was told, just Friday, I was told about an elderly lady who, I was told about this because this elderly lady had come to the person that was telling me and uh, had asked the person who was telling me the story. This other lady came to her and wanted to borrow $25,000 cash. <clears throat> and the lady that was telling me, she said, I, 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 could, I couldn't do that. And I said, well, what, what was going on? And she said, now this, and I know it's true because this person who told me I wouldn't make it up. It'd be like if one of you told me something, I would. I know it was true. This lady had sent a hundred thousand dollars to a man with whom she'd fallen in love who oh. <laughs> worked for the United Nations but lived in Africa. Oh. And she'd sent the money. I had a lady, and she's deceased now, and this was a long time ago, so not nobody, you have to be careful. But you nobody, you won't know that. You won't be it's I can tell this story too. And I never make this stuff up. I don't know the story about the guy in the airplane. I read that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I <clears throat> talked about it being in Minnesota, but I mean, that's <clears throat> But I don't make this stuff up. There was a lady that called me one day. And this was when I was over at the church where I was before I retired. Oh, wonderful lady. And she said to me, she said, I'm so ashamed of myself. Can you come over? And I went over, and she told me this story. She had been notified by some people in Toronto that she had won a lottery in Canada. And all she needed to do was to send a couple hundred dollars to take care of some paperwork, and then she would be sent two and a half million. Well, so obviously, I mean, she sent the 200. Uh, and, and they really wanted it, for some legal reason, it had to be wired. What's the, what, what is that, what, uh, what do you wire money? What's the question? It's gone. <laughs> well, what is it called? 
Telegram? Yeah, yeah, but there's Western, a, Union. Western, Western Union. Western Union. Western Union. So she sent 200, and that was great. They were then there were some taxes, provincial taxes that had to be paid. So well, of course, I mean, if you're going to get a million and a half, what's you know, what's a couple thousand? And over a period of weeks, she and this, not making it up, she had sent $8,500. So when I went to see her, I called that. They lived in a county island. They lived in one of the parks that's an island. You know what that means? It's not Mesa. It's not Mesa. And uh, so I called Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. And he had a deputy come out. He could. He got, we arranged it. He came later that day, and I came back and talked. And uh, he explained it. And I, I remember, I said to the deputy, I said, "Is there any possibility that she can get that money back?" And he said, "Absolutely not." Do you know? Do you know that these crooks, and some of them are scam artists that are going to try to get you to send money because they tell you you won the lottery like that. But others of them are people that are going to fix your roof. <laughs> Even though it doesn't need fixing. You know that people like that are not stupid. They target, they know who lives in which zip code. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Yes! If your zip code is 85120, which is our zip code, you know that there's a huge number of seniors living in parks or living in places like Fountain of the Sun. Seniors. And what, are they, what do the crooks know about most seniors? They have some money. Some have money. Some have a lot of it. But that's not the most important thing. That's not the most important thing. They hope you have money. But a lot of seniors, you don't have money. You might have some. The most important thing they know about you, and you, and you, and you, and you, is that you're pretty, no, not pretty. You're nine times out of ten, you're very honest. Because that's the way you were brought up. You're honest, you're kind, you learned how to work about the same time you started school. And when you give your word, it's good. They know that about you. They know that about the greatest generation and this generation that's right behind it. And so, if they can get a hold of it. And they know that all of us, you know, gee, wow. Winning a prize or something, but that's not the most important thing. They know that, oh, that you are honest, that you're hardworking, and sometimes because you come from North Dakota, you might be just a little gullible. <laughs> Don't record that. <laughs> it's off. <laughs> No, I don't, I mean, the people of the upper Midwest, the people of, you know, people like my parents, they're salt of the earth. They don't automatically think that somebody's trying to scam you, do you? No. You don't think that? Okay, I'm way off on a <laughs> But, not, it's important. I mean, Christianity isn't just about every, you know, it's not about, Stuff that's way up there, you know. Christ Paul says, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk in a tyrannical state. Don't, you know, don't go walking down the street carrying a cross in Ephesus. Because if you do, your lab will be, well, they even shoot you because they didn't have guns. But your lab will be killed for that. Use your sense. Now we, we tell us to carry the cross because we live in, in a free country. We can evangelize. Nobody ever threatened Billy Graham for preaching to hundreds of millions of people. 
But that was not the case in Ephesus, so be careful. And so today, Paul says, given our situation, be careful. Okay. Secondly, Paul says, let the Holy Spirit guide you. That was the second part. Remember that the Holy Spirit is within you. Remember what Martin Luther said, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. Nobody's here today because you decided to be here on your own. Nobody's a Christian because you can decide, you can decide to be a lion. You can belong to the lions. You can be, I, I, all these names. You can be a lion. You can be an eagle. You can be a moose. You can be an elk. Okay. An elk. <laughs> There's more. You can, you can decide to be a Republican. Or a Democrat. Or an Independent. You can decide, if you're a veteran, you can decide, well, I'm going to belong to the Legion. Well, I don't think. I'll belong to the FW. You can decide to be part of lots and lots of different organizations and causes, all of which are good. I mean, they do, like lions, I know they do lots of good things. You can decide, well, I think I'll join the lion. You can't decide to be a Christian in the same way. You can't do it. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, Believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called you. That's what's happening now. That's what's been happening to most of you for most of your lives. The Holy Spirit started calling you when you, you couldn't decide what to eat. Your mom decided. The Holy Spirit started calling you when you were just a little tot. In Sunday school. Or maybe you never went to Sunday school. Maybe the Holy Spirit called you when you attended one of Billy Graham's uh, crusades, revivals. It's always the Holy Spirit who's calling. And not only does He call us, Luther says, He enlightens us, He sanctifies us, and He keeps us in the one true faith. You're here today because the Holy Spirit is within you. He's calling. Come now. Come. I know you wanted to go to the golf course, but I want you to go to church first. Oh, okay. See what I'm saying? That's how much God loves us. He not only gives us the gift of a Savior, He helps us, He enables us, He makes it possible for us to receive it. Remember when you gave your little children, or they're two years old, and you give them at Christmas time, and oh, they're under there looking at them, and you give them a beautiful <coughs> Christmas present in a beautiful box with a bowl. Remember? You not only give them the present, you got to get down on the floor and help them open it. Right? <laughs> Mommy, I can't get it open. So you got, well, here, let me help you. That's the way it is with Jesus. Not only does the Father love us so much that He gives us the Savior, but now He's got to help us and continue to help us to receive the Savior. <clears throat> Isn't that great? Thirdly, Paul says we have to be thankful. <coughs> Remember to be thankful. And that's so important. Remember to be thankful. And now I want to tell another story. And it's kind of about, uh, it's about the whole, everything here. And I, you don't mind if I tell the story. Milky's here, Audrey and Merle, right here in front row. <laughs> Last Sunday, or Saturday, Audrey, they both came up to me and they said, you know, we help a lot of people. This little congregation helps a lot of people. We're not into, you know, we're not, this isn't a cathedral. It costs 40 bucks for this room. 
There's a lot of churches that cost five million, and they don't have any more people in them than we have. It's not a very good use of funds, is it? But, and so what do we do? We help. We do what Paul wants us to do. We allow the Spirit to direct us and guide us. We express our thanksgiving and gratitude, not only in words, but in deeds. And so they have a lady that comes and cleans their uh, house. And she's a wonderful lady, right? I mean, she's a, you said she's a great, she cleans. And a lot of us have uh, people that come and, and maybe once a week or something, they come and, and clean. And <clears throat> it's a good thing. And this lady is quite poor. Very poor. Very poor. And she kind of lives in different, you said now she's kind of staying in a... She don't really have a home. She just moves like from maybe three months here or two months there. Or, yeah, you know. Doesn't really have a home. This home is uh, up for, it's going to be up for sale. Okay. And she's in there cleaning it up. And I think she is right, has a right to live in there until they... <laughs> She's cleaning up a home that's going to be sold and being allowed to stay there for now. So, I mean, this is a poor lady, but she's a wonderful lady who works hard, does a great job, doesn't have a car, has to have a friend drive her to where, to the house that she's going to clean. And one day, she happened to mention this, and she happened to say, you know, boy, if I just had a bicycle, and uh, then, when I'm in the neighborhood, you know, I, could, I wouldn't have to walk to the next house, especially when it's so hot out, I could be still hot riding a bike, but at least you get there sooner. And so I could ride my bike. So you came and you, you talked to me about it, and Jerry was here, and I talked to him about it. He's the chairman of the board. And I said, well, we can help with that. And uh, so I, so what this lovely couple right here, because they care about people, because they're the kind of people that all of you are. That's the kind of people we were raised to be. You help your neighbor out. You do what you can. You do the. You do as I used to say, and and uh, uh, Donna Hagen used to like. You do what you're supposed to do, just because you're supposed to. That didn't make much sense, but that's the point, right? So, they went to the lady, oh, she called me from the store. They were over at Walmart. They found the bike that this lady thought, well, that's the one. That would be great. You don't want some 12 you know, gear or something or other that you can't figure. You just want a bike. <coughs> that a 45-year-old lady is going to be able to ride from house to house with a basket maybe to put her stuff in or whatever. That's, you want the bike that she wants. So they found it. And Audrey called me and she said, well, we found the bike. And, uh, but uh, what, what should we do? And I said, uh, well, I said, I'll tell you what. I think they tried to call Jerry and didn't get you. I said, how much is the bike? How much was it? $160. I said, well, I said, could you just buy the bike? And then we'll reimburse. But I mean, we didn't, you could, it, when he writes a check, you've got to have two signatures. And we can't fool with that right now. We do that later. So they bought the bike for this lady. And when they gave her the bike, when they took the bike, she had tears in her eyes. And she said, nobody's ever, what'd she say? Nobody's ever done anything for me. Nobody's ever done anything for me. I'm getting a little misty myself. How about it? Isn't that great? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's what we do at Genesis. That's what we do for the ladies, the whole women's hope. I mean, we do it all the time. And I know it's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us. He said, Jesus himself said, for as much as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Yeah. 
I've said it before and I'll say it again, then we'll close here. I want you to know that next June, on June 30th, I'll celebrate 45 years of, since my ordination. And uh, about 40 years then in the ministry, most of it in parish ministry and military. Because you know I, soldier in Vietnam, but when you were a chaplain in Vietnam, no, 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 I was a soldier in Vietnam. I became a chaplain later. So I've been serving in the parish ministry and in the military ministry for 40, it'll be 45 years. But this is the frosting on the cake. This is the frosting on the cake. I believe I heard a lady on TV this past week, and it was when they were talking about the priests, the scandals, you know, in uh, Pennsylvania, some 300 priests having yes. abused a thousand children. And they were talking, that was in the news, and this one lady said, well, she said, you know, I've never, she said, I am a believer, but I've never, I've never really liked organized religion. <clears throat> I kind of thought about that. And, you know, sometimes I think that gets to be a problem. Organized religion, in some ways, I think of the whole Christian church on earth could just sort of be like Church of Grace. Just, and that's the way it was in the very beginning. People actually got together in their homes. It's fun to, I mean, I like getting together like we are. And, you know, in the wintertime we have, get up to around 300 people, so we just rent a bigger hall. And I know you have to have you have to have a place for Sunday school and so forth, but just look, look at you look at some of the look at the National Cathedral in Washington, DC. It took 50 years to build it. And it cost millions. Probably a hundred million. I mean, wow, is that like I say, this is frosting on the cake. To me, it's a hundred, it means a hundred times more to me to know that this lady got a bicycle than to have a five million dollar church that I built. <laughs> of course, with other people's money. <laughs> <clears throat> I never liked that. I grew up in a little country church like most of you. And if the roof needed repairing, my dad and a bunch of the, you know, they repaired it. It was a little country church. It was a church that didn't, and, and they didn't pay the preachers much because they didn't have much. Just like Church of Grace. Huh? Just like Church of Grace. Just like Church of Grace. But they didn't have much. I mean, and the ministers were up here. They were looked up to because they were the shepherds. You could call them any time, night or day, and they would come. If your little child was dying, the men, they, their first call went to the doctor who used to make house calls, and the second call went to the minister. And they got in their old Model T or whatever it was, and they were there. And that was the, that's the way my whole ministry was. But sometimes, especially in my last call, and I don't want to get into specifics, but there were things that were not right. They just weren't right. And uh, I'm glad, I'm so glad that even though I retired, I retired, what, five years ago? 2000, no, four years ago. I retired four years ago, but I'm so thankful that I was, I've been able to spend my retirement with you. Because it's, it's brought back 
a sense of satisfaction, a sense of serenity, a sense of fun, a sense of feeling, you know, now this, now, now I'm back to doing what I know the Lord wants me to do. And I don't have to mess around with a lot of stuff that I know for a fact. So, I'm thankful, very thankful to all of you, and I don't know how much longer we're going to go, I don't know, you know, if I should retire full, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I'm not worried about it, I'll think about it, but I don't know, but I know one thing, <coughs> these, it'll, in November now, it'll be three years, the three years that we've had little old Church of Grace, we have helped literally hundreds Many individually, like on these families with the children. But you get into hundreds because of outfits like Genesis. They feed up to, in the winter, they feed up to 150, 200 people a day sometimes. And they do it because other groups and people like us help them move. So I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. Now what we're going to do is we're going to sing about, remember I said the Holy Spirit? us. The Holy Spirit is the reason we're here. He's leading us, guiding us, and we're, you know, we're, we're followed. What do you want us to do? Well, the Holy Spirit says, get that lady a bike. You say, oh, he didn't really say that. Well, maybe not in so many words, but he said it. Let's sing number 150. Come, Holy Spirit. Goodness. Hear, us, hear us now as we pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.